2 Samuel chapter 13. We're going to talk um, maybe a little more of a, a harder topic, if you will, uh, but I think we're going to make this very practical. And uh, just we see a major, a major issue. And I want you to write this down. Tragedy in the king's family. Tragedy in the king's family. You remember we saw with David, David did great things for God. David was a very humble shepherd boy. David never felt like in the beginning he deserved to be king. David was, uh, was, uh, it was Samuel came and anointed David to be the next king of Israel. And David never really felt he deserved it. The difference with him and Saul, Saul never felt he deserved it in the beginning either. But eventually it went to Saul's head. And it completely destroyed Saul's life. And Saul went way off the rails. David, for a time, it'll go to his head and he'll go way off the rails. And when you go way off the rails, get away from God. Damage will follow. Tragedies will come. Can you get back on track? Yes. And the sooner the better. Because the more you're off track and doing your own thing and abandoning God, as David found out, the more hardships that follow. I'm going to say something that's very hard for us to hear tonight, but there are things that people have done, maybe it's a previous family or previous friends or previous things in the past that still affect us today. David affected his son, and because of David's sin, not only David's sin, but David had a part to play, I believe, in this drama that's going to unfold in 2 Samuel chapter 13. The Bible talks, I think it's in Deuteronomy, how generation after generation, and I don't remember the, the place exactly, I think it's Deuteronomy, where it talks about how sin would affect generation after generation, and friend, it can. Oh, it hurts, and it's dangerous, and it's hard. We're going to talk about this. I want you to write down three things very quickly as we start tonight. Tragedy in the king's family. I, I, I purposely didn't say the royal family. Because uh, I know we've heard that on the news, right? All that stuff going on with the royal family. We went with the king's family. I want you to write down these three things. Choices, friends, and the true heart of man. Choices, friends, and the true heart of man. All of this will come to play in chapter 13. We're going through this book, and on purpose, we, we don't really skip stuff. We're just going through, and we're trying to see how it applies to our life. So we find here in chapter 13, David had a devotion to the things of the Lord for a time. But then we see his, this, uh, this devotion for God seemed to have missed somewhere with him and his children. Um, we don't see a lot of what David taught his children. Obviously, we see a little bit in Solomon. But as far as we can tell, David was probably, seems to be a bad father. At the very least, he was a bad role model for his children. Because what, uh, what uh, Absalom's, or excuse me, what Amnon is going to do is going to replicate some of the things that David did in his life. The inability to say no, uh, to, to give in to temptation. Um, now, we find a man who sins and had brought consequences not only on himself, but also others. Friend, listen very closely. Your sin will not just affect you. There will always be others. The hard part for a dad to hear is my sin will affect my children. Having, a, having another child in the home, what a big responsibility to raise that child to love and honor and serve the Lord. And once they hit that time where they move out, that's on them. They get to do, I hope I can instill in them a love for the God, and I hope they can see a life that I've lived in such a way where they could honor God uh, by watching that. That's my prayer. It's not always what I do, but that's my prayer. Now, let's pick up in verse 1 here. Choices, friends, the heart of man, okay? And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister. It's the idea of a very beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. That's how we pronounce it. It was probably more pronounced Tamar, but we'll go with Tamar because that's how we, that's how I think, at least that's how I grew up saying it. So maybe you said it the right way all along. I don't know. But we'll go with Tamar tonight. And Amnon, the son of David, what? Loved her. 
Now, as far as we can count, I think David had uh, several, several wives, several children, and Amnon was the prince. He was, uh, Michael was his first wife, and then he had a second wife, and it was from her that he would have Amnon. And he had several sons that we find, I don't know, I don't remember, maybe some of you remember, I think it was eight or nine maybe, I think eight or nine sons, and I don't see a lot of daughters. We know of this one for sure. So we have different mothers for several different children. By the way, that's, that's, a, that's a problem in and of itself that makes for hardship. Now we see in this line, we have Amnon, who was the crown prince of the royal family. He was, it, it, from what we read, he got his way. He was a spoiled brat. It seems like he, uh, he was taken special care of by David and uh, probably didn't get enough uh, discipline growing up, I would assume. Um, but we find here Amnon, he is the oldest son out of the eight or nine, I don't remember how many, seven, eight, nine in that area, and he has a daughter named Tamar. Look at what the Bible says in verse 2, okay? And Amnon was so what? Vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. I want you to write this down as we look at this story. We'll be, we'll be very appropriate and very, very kind and very sensitive, but we do have to understand some principles. I want you to write down number one, a fallen desire. A fallen desire. David, for a time, became less focused on God's will for himself and more on personal pleasure. Why do I keep alluding back to David? Why do I keep doing that? Because God had put David on a level. And God had put David in a position. And God expects more from people he has given so much to. Okay? By the way, there will be a difference in judgment from when a pastor falls than when someone else may fall because God will put them in a position to lead. There is a lot of pressure. Okay? God will, now, will God judge everyone for sin as far as in our relationship with him? Yes. But when a pastor falls, God will take care of that pastor. God will take care of that pastor's sin. Okay, and I want you to see, God put David in such a position, the reason I keep alluding back to David is because God had given him so much, and he got comfortable. Remember us reading? What was he doing? Instead of going to battle, that's what God had planned for David. Go to battle, build the kingdom, I'll use your son to build the temple. Your job is to go into battle. David said, forget what God wants, because now everything's good, I have Joab, I can get comfortable. And we talked about when you get comfortable in the Christian life, you make poor decisions. David still had a choice. Instead of, instead of staying busy, David probably slept in, in the, late in the morning and went to bed really late and kind of just enjoyed life for a little bit, thought he had a reason to relax. And David saw Bathsheba, and you know the story. David still could have said no, but David was really not interested at that moment in following God and his will. So David continued on into sin. And of course, we saw from that sin how one thing after another after another, and then God promises all of David's wives are going to be taken from him. And uh, this will be a part of that as we'll see the story unfold. So I want you to write down uh, a fallen desire. Amnon reveals to us a lack of self-control, poor character, poor friends, selfish behavior, and uh, downright wicked living. Okay, Amnon reveals to us a lack of self-control, poor character, poor friends, selfish behavior. Okay, I hope you'll examine your life and make sure you're examining inside and making sure you don't lack self-control. You know how to say no. You, you work on that. You teach yourself and you put yourself in a position to say no. You have high character, not only when other people are around, but when you're in private, you keep good friends. Friends will influence you, as we're going to see here in a little bit. And then you're not, you don't have selfish behavior where it's all about you. So a fallen desire. In verse 1 and 2, you know what the word Amnon means? Faithful and stable. <laughs> Amnon failed that one, didn't he? Faithful and stable. He had, he had everything going for him. He was the son of King David. He was pampered. 
He was, pro he was a prince. He could get what he wants. He, he, could, he had his daddy at his fingertips, if you will. He had everything. You know what he also had? He was in a place of worship. He lived in, in, uh, in, in Israel now, and he had David, and David loved God, and he had known of God, and he had heard of God, and he had the ability and the opportunity to worship. He chose not to. He, he could fake it or serve with sincerity. He was the son of the king. Everything was going for him. But he chose his desires, his fleshly desires, over following God. It was a fallen desire. Now he has a choice. Okay, she, the word she was a virgin means she's available for marriage. But uh, marriage to his sister-in-law was forbidden. Okay, it was wrong. And we'll look at a couple passages in Leviticus. We'll look at that here in a little bit. He would have known these things and would have heard these things. He knew it was wrong. Tamar knew it was wrong. And yet his flesh would override. Now he has a choice. Will he allow the wicked thoughts to continue to fester to the point of sin as he has seen his dad do? Isn't it interesting? When his dad wanted something or someone, he would take them. It didn't matter if they were married. It didn't matter what they had going. And now his son replicates what his dad does. Um, you know, uh, Lucas, he does the same thing. I am very loud in our home. Quest came out today. I was singing and uh, just blaring in the kitchen. I was chopping up pineapple. And as she came out and said, man, the baby is trying to sleep. And as she's telling me this, Lucas is at the table not paying attention. And he's just eating his food. And he starts singing just as loud as his daddy. And Quest said, you have to tell him no because he just watched you do that. So he watches everything we do. And you know where uh, Amnon got this from? His dad. He watched his dad get what he wanted. He watched his dad fulfill his desires. It was a fallen desire. Now, don't get me wrong. David is not to blame for Amnon's decision. Amnon had a, a decision to make. Okay? And just because there were dads with poor examples, it doesn't mean we have an excuse to sin. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying tonight. You have no excuse to sin. You still choose to sin. But David could have changed this outcome if he would have overcame his flesh instead of giving into it. If he would have chosen God's way. Okay, I believe it all started with dad. The downfall of David's kingdom came when he gave into his flesh. And he never dealt with sin. Friend, listen. If you have sin, which you do, if you have an ongoing sin that you feel like you cannot have victory over, it's going to lead to problems, not only now, but tomorrow. And it could cause problems in your family later on. Deal with sin sin. God promises victory. Deal with that sin. Be honest with God. Please stop hiding it. You know, we would go to those camps when I was growing up, those teen camps. And uh, around the fire, they would tell us, give that sin over to God. Repent and turn from it. And year after year, you'd give up sin, and then you'd go back home and you'd do it again. But I remember getting to a habit. When God put sin on my heart, I confessed it right then and there. Now, I'm not always that way. I still fall and slide. But my, my purpose is I need to be focused on dealing with sin. He has this fallen desire. Absalom was Tamar's sister. Okay, so we have Absalom, we have Amnon, and we have Tamar. That Absalom's going to come more in our story later on. Okay, let's continue reading here. This is drama in this royal family. We see a fallen nature. We see a heart that is displeasing to God. Go to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Okay, and I want you to go down to verse, um, verse 9. Okay, in this fallen nature, let's not be too harsh on Amnon for thinking thoughts he shouldn't have thought. Okay, because we all do that. We think thoughts we shouldn't think, but sometimes we go too far and we act on that. Instead of getting forgiveness and praying for a clean mind and a clean heart. Look at what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then God says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Go back to verse 7. 
Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. When Amnon is thinking these things in this fallen nature, was he being blessed by God? No. He was following his fallen nature, his fallen flesh. He became so sick to himself that eventually he said, nothing's going to stand in my way to get what I want. Because he dwelled on it and he thought on it. He was trying to plot how he was going to do it. It made him sick to his stomach to commit this sin. He desired it so badly. Friend, that's what can happen when we dwell on sin. When we don't recognize that my heart is deceitful. And when I continually think on these things I have no business thinking of. And dwelling on that hurt and that pain. It just builds up. That's why we have to deal with that with the Lord. Okay? Now, he became so sick. I love this quote, and I don't remember who wrote it. We must take our emotions, thoughts, desires, and worries and lay them at the feet of Jesus, asking him to guide our steps. Go to Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25, would you? Very quickly tonight. Proverbs 25. Verse 28, if you would. Okay? The Bible says this, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Okay, those who have no self-control, they've never dealt with it. They're, they're just kind of like a city when there's no walls. The walls are broken down. It's wide open so the enemy can come. So a person with no self-control never learned to say no, never learned to say, no, I can't do that, never put principles in place to protect ourselves. They're like a city that's wide open to the enemy, and the enemy can just come with no problem, and they can overtake you. Who is our enemy? The devil, the world, the flesh. When we have no self-control, we are wide open for an attack. Friend, we've got to learn. We've got to learn this is our fallen nature. I want you to see number two, a terrible friend. A terrible friend. Look at verse three. Okay, so he's going through this. He had poor friendship now. Look at verse three. But Amnon had a what? Whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimeon, David's brother. And Jonadab was a what? A very subtle man. Okay, this man, um, this man was known as a little mischievous, a little deceitful, if you will. This, uh, a good friend is a friend who tells the truth at times, even if it hurts. Amen? We need some good friends in the church who will be honest with us and love us through it. But man, I want people who at times, they'll just be straight up with me. They'll just be honest with me. They'll just shoot straight about it instead of, uh, you know, pampering. So uh, Amnon knew what he was doing was wrong. So look at what he says in verse 4. His friend was with him, and this is what his friend said. By the way, this is why it's important to have good friends. But uh, in verse 4, and he said unto him, why art thou being the king's son? He comes and saying, hey, you're the son of the king. Le lean from day to day. Wilt thou not tell me? So his friend came, as a good friend does. A friend can tell when you're having a bad day, right? A good friend can tell when you're going through a hard time. So we asked him, and Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother, Absalom's sister. So his friend comes in and says, man, you've been down lately. You're struggling. Why do you feel that you're the king's son? You can have whatever you want. His friend knew he was pampered. Okay, so what does he say? Man, I have a desire. It's a bad desire, and it's wicked, and it's against the book of Leviticus. It's wrong, but I have this desire. What should a good friend do at that point? They ought to stop. They ought, if someone is truly seeking advice, by the way, that's a big if, because a lot of people don't care about what you have to say, but a good friend is going to stop and say, hold on a minute, what does God say about it? Let's you and me together study what God says about it. That'd be a good friend. But instead, we have a carnal man. Instead, um, sometimes, uh, let me, everybody listen to this for a quick moment. Uh, sometimes we try to coddle people who the Holy Spirit is trying to convict. Christians are very good at this. Sometimes somebody comes to us and they say, I know what I'm doing is wrong, and I know I shouldn't be doing this, but man, I, I just, I'm struggling. And good Christian people come along, hey, 
you just do your best and you just leave the rest up to God. You just do the best. Now, I, I know sometimes we mean well, but sometimes the Holy Spirit is trying to convict them and say, hey, you've got to quit going down this road. And we as Christians just say, it's okay, it'll all be better soon. Just go. No. We need to say, well, what is God telling you? What does the Bible say about it? That would be a good friend, right? That's not what his friend said. This was a carnal man. He was known for being sneaky. He always had an edge. This is the person who can masquerade and maybe even tell you and act like they're helping you. That was not this person. He was a terrible friend. So what does he tell him to do? Look at verse 5. Okay? A friend's advice can get you in a lot of trouble. That's why I have some really good ones. And by the way, have a few people in your life that you trust that are godly people who you would go to and actually accept their advice. I'll listen to anybody. If you have something, I'll listen to it, and I'll probably go along with it. I'll listen to anybody. But there's four or five people, if they came to me and they really told me, I would, I would stop what I was doing, and we would really dig into it. There's four or five people that have a major influence in my life to the point where I would say, you know what, if, if you're telling me this, my dad is one of them. My dad's a very godly man. If my dad came to me and sat down with me, I would, I would go, you know, I'd really, really consider that. If Pastor Wilkerson, my former pastor, if he came to me, there are certain men in my life who I have given permission. If they came to me and saw I was going down the wrong road, if they said something, I would snap to attention. Man, I would be all over that because I want good friends to influence me. And there are certain people I, I don't want to influence me, right? That's why I love having a church full of godly spiritual people who truly love the Lord. And those are the people I want to influence me. Not the ones who are always upset about people. Not the ones who are always, I want people who love God with all of their heart. And those are the type of people I want to be around. That's why I love coming to church. I love being around godly people. I love being around people who love the book the way I love the book. Who if the book said it, they would change. Those are the type of people I want to be around. That was not Jonadab. Okay? Be careful about the type of friends. What does Jonadab say in verse 5? Very quickly. Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, Oh, daddy's going to come and check on you. This was an adult son. When thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat, dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it and eat it at her hand. Don't just bring a dinner and drop it off. This was deceit. This was lying. This was wicked. This was wrong. Be careful of the friends you keep. Relationships either add to or take away from our lifestyles for the Lord. I want friends who point me back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Biblical friendship is one that encourages biblical growth and is filled with love. Examine your life to see if you have some unhealthy relationships. There may be some people that maybe you don't, you know, just say, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. But you may need to just establish in your mind, these people are not going the same way I'm going. I'm going to be careful how much I, how much I give them oh, to oversee my life. What is a good friend? A good friend encourages us to do right. Okay, I have several scriptures. We're not going to go to these tonight. A good friend encourages us to do right. Okay? A good friend forgives. Forgiveness is a staple. Okay? If you want to be a good friend, forgive really quickly. Forgive really quickly. Encourage them to do right. A good friend gives wise counsel. Proverbs eleven fourteen. A good friend gives wise counsel. Um, a good friend just doesn't spout what's on the edge of their tongue. They think about it. They dwell on it because they know that this person, they'll be affected by what we have to say. I'm guilty of this. I'm a rambler <laughs> at times. And I have to be careful because there's some people who really depend on what I have to say. And that's why sometimes I'll tell people, hey, wait a little bit. Give me some time to think about it. I don't want to say the first thing that pops into my head. Okay? I want to be careful because I want to be a good friend that encourages them to do right, that forgives, that gives wise counsel. And fourthly, there's no selfishness or pride. Man, in my friendships, I don't want to be selfish and I don't want to be prideful. That I'm any better than anyone else. Okay? This was not Jonadab. Be careful who your friends are. Be careful who you allow to influence major decisions. I'm very careful. I have a group that I would allow to influence before I make a big decision. I call them. There are certain people I do. And I value their opinion greatly. 
It doesn't mean I don't value yours as well, but there are certain people I allow to really influence my life. And I hope you get some. Make sure you have three or four, maybe two or three, four or five, whatever it is. Have a few people that you go to and you say, hey, I want you to keep an eye out for me. And if you see anything, I know you're going to come to me with love and compassion, and I know you're going to be looking out for me. And I want those type of friends. Lastly, I want you to see a revealed heart. A revealed heart. So we've seen this terrible friend. We've seen this fallen desire. Now we see a terrible revealed heart. A revealed heart. Look at verse 6 if you would. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar my sister come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar saying, go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house and he was laid down and she took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes. And she took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, have out all men from me. And they went out every man from him. And Amnon said unto Tamar, bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber, chamber to Amnon her brother. This is a revealed heart. This is a sick heart. This is a wicked heart. This is a devastating heart. This was a heart that displeased God. This was a person who had a position and had authority, and he used it in the wrong, a wicked way. But this is who he truly was. You can write this down. Leviticus 20, verse 17, and Leviticus 18, verse 11. This was clearly against God's will and God's plan. But we see this revealed heart. Amnon was so filled with lust and selfish pride, he would not even stop to consider the words of God. Do I believe that Amnon knew it was wrong? Yeah. Because we're going to see his response here in a little bit and the guilt that came with it. Amnon knew exactly what he was doing to displease God. And here's the sad part. Sometimes you and I do too. We have a fallen desire. We never fix it. We have some poor friends. And when you put those two things together, you get caught in a place you know what you're doing is wrong. You know you're away from God. You know this is not going to bring God honor and glory, but you do it anyway. Now, maybe it's not to this extent. What he's going to do is something that's deplorable. Absolutely life-changing for Tamar. Wickedness. But it reveals what his heart was. So what does Tamar do? We don't have time. We're almost out of time tonight. Tamar is going to tell him no. She's going to tell him the results of this. There'll be no way to hide it. It'll be out there. There'll be shame. There'll be guilt. We cannot do this act. This would be wicked. Amnon doesn't listen. He's so full of his lust. The Bible says he loved her earlier on. We find out this is not true love. This is lust. Sadly, what is our country pushing more than anything? Lust. On our, our school buses and you know, driving them and listening to teenagers and kids, it's all about what you can offer me. It's all about breaking up. It's all about getting back together. It's all about what you have for me. Friend, that's not a relationship and that's not marriage either. Marriage is when I'm out for you and you're out for me and we're working together, working as a team, looking out for each other's best interests, not our own personal desires. It's for each other. This was not true love. This was lust. David caters to his adult child and sends Tamar over there. And I don't have any reason to believe that David knew what would happen. Sends her over there and she goes in and Amnon would defile Tamar. She said no, and she fought it. She knew it was wicked, and she knew it was wrong. He would do it anyway. You see, if David would have been a better father, if David would have not treated his children a different way because he felt guilty for the past, so he would coddle them, and he would give in to their fleshly desires, if David would have been a better role model, he could have, I believe, prevented this sin from happening. Now, I'm not saying that Amnon didn't have a choice, but I'm saying Amnon did exactly what he had watched his leadership do this whole time. And friend, you and I, as in any point we have in leadership, whether it's grandchildren or children or spouse or whatever it may be, maybe it's a position in a church, whatever position we hold, people who look up to us are going to watch how we live, what we say, how we act. It's just going to be part of their life. 
That's what we find happened here. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not blaming Amnon's sin on David. Amnon had a choice. What I am saying is David could have definitely helped that situation had he made some better decisions. Amen? And you and I can make some better decisions now to prevent some nonsense later on. This revealed his heart. So what does he do? Guilt. He knew what he was doing was wrong. Um, he, he, he knew the way he was living was wrong. So he lies to David. He lies to Tamar. Amnon is trying to deceive everyone around him. By the way, secrets destroy. Secrets are not good. Okay? For the most part. Secrets, are, secrets cause issues uh, in, in most cases. Honesty is biblical, Proverbs 12, 19. This was a man who lacked integrity, who lacked morals. This was not just a brief moment of a poor decision. By the way, sometimes we're in the heat of the moment, something just happens, we sin, it wasn't planned and thought out. But friend, this was planned, this was thought out, every detail was worked out, this was... He gets to this point, this spoiled prince would get what he wanted instead of learning self-control. Amnon had no real love for Tamar, only lust. So immediately after this happens, you can continue to read the story. As soon as it happens, the Bible says he hated her more than he loved her. He kicked her out because every time he would see her, it would remind her of his guilt and his shame. So he wanted nothing to do with her. Man, what a wicked man this was. And what this would do, this would eventually lead to anger from Absalom. Tamar would find out, or excuse me, Absalom would find out what Amnon had done to his sister. And Absalom from that day forward would look for a way to kill Amnon. Wasn't that long later until Absalom had his chance and Absalom, and David did nothing about it. David knew about it. But I believe David was guilty for his own life, and he was still coddling that child. He still didn't want to cause a rift in the kingdom, so he didn't do anything about it. So it boiled up in Absalom. Do you see the mess that has been made? It's only getting worse, and it's only going to get worse. As we continue to read, Absalom's going to commit murder, and he's going to kill Amnon. Absalom's going to run from the kingdom. David, there's going to be a rift between David and Absalom for a long time, and then eventually David's going to miss Absalom and want his son back. But Absalom's going to turn on David and try to take the kingdom away from him. Do you see all these steps that we get to look down at and we get to see? Man, what a hardship. What a tough time. This poor lady, Tamar, she was trying to do the right thing. She was trying to be biblical. This wicked man hurt her life. Oh, what pain. Oh, what heart. Do you see what sin does when it's not dealt with? And I want you to see the seriousness of sin. It doesn't stop with you. It doesn't stop. Friend, you and I have got to see the seriousness here. and We've got to see the hurt that comes with it. And friend, right now, with the way the world's going, there is no self-control. With the way the family is going, that's why, you know, parents aren't together and everybody's leaving each other and there's nothing good. And now we see, because uh, the divorce rate has skyrocketed, we see families that are apart. And now we see they're, they're having children and they're having children. And now we see the effects of that sin that was done in the previous generation. And now we're going to replicate that and we're going to even go a step farther. You see how that works? Why don't you and I be some people in our generation, our family, where we put a stop to that? Yes, that stuff has happened. Yes, that stuff hurts. But we've got to say, you know what? We can do better for the Lord. Amnon chose to live this way, and he made some bad decisions. Absalom's going to do some things that are wrong. Uh, David's going to lose his kingdom for a while. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Do you see the seriousness? Do you see how a lack of self-control can not only hurt us, hurt our family, but hurt our community? Man, I could tell you story after story, and you know some. Even in our own church history here, pastors getting in trouble, people getting in trouble, people being asked to leave the church because of sin and hidden sin, all these things that happen because there's no self-control. Once you see this tonight, your choices, your friends, will eventually reveal the real heart inside of you. Are you making good choices this week? Do you have the right friends? Oh, that could change your whole life. 
Be careful about the company you keep. And then that will reveal the real heart inside of you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you tonight, God, and I just thank you so much for our time of prayer that we've had. God, we prayed that our hearts would be stirred. God, I thank you so much for your word, Lord, and just a tough message tonight. Oh, God, we see the effects of sin. God, we see how many people it can hurt. God, we understand that we can only control us. We can't change other people, but we can control what we do in our future. Lord, I pray you'd help each one of us to start something for our family starting tonight. Lord, just as we go forward, we would have self-control and we would live in such a way that we could be that friend that other people need to have. We could be that person that they could come to and that we could be honest with them and they would actually listen and they would change. Lord, help us to be the right role models for our children or our grandchildren or for other people in the church. Lord, I love you. I pray that you'd help us in these areas tonight. Take what we've learned tonight, our hearts, our friends, and uh, Lord, I just pray you'd help us in, in these choices that we have to make on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue to read God's word. It opens things up on a greater level. Thank you so much for being faithful. Remember somebody to pray for, okay? Look around the room. You see someone maybe not here.